Well, hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Louise lavic and I'm the Interim Head of Science at the FBA. So I just wanted to say welcome to this latest installment of the FBA seminar series, where we're exploring the careers to date of the FBA fellows and telling you more about some key FBA projects. We hope you've enjoyed the seminar series so far, and if you've missed any talks, all of them are available to view under the Discover and Learn tab of the FBA website. If you're enjoying the series and you're not already an FBA member, you can become a member under the Join Us tab on the FBA website. Uh, along with a wide range of membership benefits, you get the priority notifications for these FBA seminars, so you can um, so you can register first and beat the rush. So for today's seminar, I'd like to welcome Professor Rick Batterby, who's a Emeritus Professor of Environmental Change at University College London and was Director of the Environmental Change Research Centre at UCL from 91 to 2007. He has also held research positions at Uppsala University in Sweden, Ulster University in Northern Ireland, Jonsu University in Finland, if I pronounce that right, Rick, <laughs> and the University of Minnesota in the USA. Rick uh, has won far too many awards to list them succinctly here, so I'm hoping we're going to hear about some of those during his talk. So over to you, Rick. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction, Lou. Uh, hello, everyone else. Um, so this is not quite a live story, but there's uh, quite a lot of history uh, in this talk. Uh, I start with going over to the new University of Ulster to do a PhD with Frank Oldfield on the left. The University of Ulster was based in, is based in Coleraine, and it opened its doors in 1968 to new postgraduate students. I spent a lot of my time helping to get a new university uh, working uh, socially with, uh, yeah, organizing bars and rugby clubs. And, uh, at the same time doing a PhD with Frank. Uh, the idea was to do work in the west of Ireland on lake sediments, working with Frank on pollen analysis. But in uh, 1967, there was this major algal bloom on Loch May. It was a bloom of Anabina flossaque, uh, and it took everybody by surprise. Uh, and Frank wondered whether it might be possible to look at the lake sediments, the recent lake sediments, to cast some light on the reasons for the algal bloom. The questions at the time were, was this just an extreme natural event? Because in 1967, it was a really hot, dry summer. Um, was it evidence of cultural eutrophication, which was the biggest international environmental topic, I think, of the day in the 1960s? Uh, and, and if so, was it the result of nutrient pollution from, from sewage works uh, or agriculture or both? So this seemed like a more exciting PhD project. Uh, the problem was with no proven biological proxies, uh, although diatoms had been shown to be promising in studies of, of older sediments, of, of post-glacial sediment sequences, uh, we didn't have any method of coring the, the uppermost sediment without uh, disturbing it. And most crucially, we had no method of dating the uppermost uh, sediment. Nevertheless, it seemed like uh, a good project to tackle. Uh, it turned out that the sediments of Loch Ness were very diatom rich. Um, I used the whole the 1930s Susfasa uh, flora uh, of Hushtets to, to try to teach myself diatom analysis and diatom taxonomy. I took pictures, light microscope pictures. I managed to partly master the big Cambridge stereo scan and take some SEM pictures of diatoms in the sediments, as you can see in that middle and, and right-hand picture. And I got help from Liz, Liz Howarth at the FBA in diatom taxonomy, uh, from Bob Ross at the Natural History Museum, uh, and most importantly, Frank Round. I spent quite a lot of time in Bristol uh, working on diatoms with, uh, with Frank. Uh, in terms of coring, uh, we uh, were lucky, again, the FBA to uh, the rescue. Uh, here is John Mackrath. John Mackrath had previously built this giant six-meter core you can see in the middle. Um, he subsequently designed a smaller core to take surface sediment samples with, as you can see on the uh, middle right uh, picture there. And this was designed to sample the uppermost sediment without disturbing it. And you can see... Uh, on the right-hand side there, uh, 
um, a picture from much later on, of course, where we've been using a modified living uh, core. That's just to illustrate the importance of for sampling that uppermost very uh, wet, organic rich uh, sediment without uh, disturbing it so that we can look at the very recent changes that have occurred uh, in the history of, of lakes. But dating, as I say, was the real problem. I was hoping from the outset that we'd be able to use radiocarbon dating. Uh, but here's some radiocarbon dates from a core from uh, the uh, Antrim Bay part of Loch Ness. It's a long core, over two meters long. We sent it off for radiocarbon dating. And you can see that the uh, dates in the early part of the sequence there, going back four or 5,000 years ago, look, look fine. Uh, as you come up through the sediment sequence, they get progressively younger in a more or less linear fashion. Uh, but then these uppermost uh, dates here are all, uh, all are all over the place. Um, they're all about 2,000 years old, even though some of them are very close to modern times. And we believe uh, that that was the result of the inwash of older carbon uh, into the lake, uh, making the radiocarbon dates artificially old. So that proved not to be a method of dating uh, recent sediments. But uh, so, so we had this difficulty, and this is my paper, uh, a diagram from a PhD, um, a, a diatom diagram. It, it shows very nicely the eutrophication, um, that blue line across there, what we classically now know to, as a good indicator of uh, eutrophication in, in lake sediments, the, the decrease in cycloteleplankton and the increase in stephanodiscus. But we had uh, evidence for early eutrophication uh, showing that that 1967 algal bloom uh, was probably caused by that um, uh, uh, cl cl climate anomaly in 1967. Uh, but in fact, the lake had becoming quite eutrophic for quite a long time before then. But just when, we were not sure at, at the time of my uh, PhD completion. But again, uh, FBA to the rescue. This is uh, Winifred Pennington, Mrs. Tutin, and she published a paper in 1973 in Nature showing the use of cesium-137 from nuclear explosions as a, as a tracer. Uh, and this is uh, the diagram fr from that paper. On the left-hand side in red is the measurements of cesium-137 in rain, uh, contemporary monitoring in rain and then a series of CC137 profiles for different lakes in the Lake District, uh, showing that uh, clear peak uh, dated normally in CC137 dating to 1963. Sometimes it's possible to use the 1954 data, or 5354 data, as the onset of CC137 deposition, uh, but quite often in sediment cores, the cesium can actually get diffused or mixed down into deeper sediments. So that's not as useful as the peak uh, as a dating point. And applying that then to Loch Ney, uh, four you know, core tops here uh, showed that we've got two cores with a rather slow accumulation rate, and then two cores here with a fast accumulation rate. And in the ones with a faster accumulation on the right hand side, it looks as if we might uh, we can pick out the 1963 peak, possibly the 1959 peak when there was a partial uh, test ban uh, uh, ban on, on nuclear weapons uh, testing. But quite clearly, it, for me at the time, this this showed that the sediment in Loch Ness was accumulating far more rapidly than I'd, I'd suppose. This is uh, over one centimeter. A year. But the real game changer was the publication of this paper by Krishna Swami et al. in 1971, uh, showing the use of LET-210 as the dating technique. This is part of the Uranium-238 series, and there's LET-210 there. It's got a half-life of 22 years, so it's perfectly suited uh, to date the uppermost sediment of lakes. And when we apply that to Loch Ness, uh, on the right-hand side there, two cores, uh, we can then date that switch to a predominantly stephanodiscus diet on flora in the sediments, and that comes out at 1915. And then a, a, a core um, with almost exactly the same record, but accumulating more rapidly. Uh, again, it, can, can, it, this, it comes out at 1915. 
so when we go back to, to my diagram from, from Loch Ness, um, we have 1915 then as the date. And this, we know now, fits really quite well with the history of eutrophication in Britain and in Western Europe. It tends to coincide with the introduction of sewerage systems into lake catchments. So these were early days. It was a problem with eutrophication. We didn't really have the techniques to contribute strongly to that debate at the time. Uh, but by the time the acid rain debate came uh, alive in the late 1970s, early 1980s, we had these techniques ready and we were able to make a much stronger contribution. So for those of a certain age will remember the acid rain debate is not much talked about these days, uh, but essentially uh, Scandinavians um, were complaining that uh, brown trout populations in lakes in the southwest part of Sweden and the southern part of Norway uh, had declined rapidly in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And the reason for that was the uh, acid deposition coming from industrial companies, countries uh, upstream and in terms of Norway, especially from, uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, th there's a map in the middle there. Or where the loss of fish populations was uh, most uh, most serious. Well, uh, so the argument was that uh, it, it was sulfur dioxide emissions and nitrogen oxide emissions from mainly British power stations that was causing the problems in 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 southern Norway. Uh, and uh, you can see this uh, picture here of uh, Ratcliffe on Soa. Uh, with the plume from the uh, chimney there uh, on its way across the North Sea to, uh, to drop acidity in Scandinavia. Um, Britain was, uh, the UK was, uh, I think, in, in denial at the time, uh, very, very defensive against these claims. Uh, and the opinion was that this is uh, not to do, there are other reasons for, for the problem in Scandinavia. Uh, in response to that, uh, Dick Wright and Arnie Henriksen from Neva in Oslo came across and worked with uh, Ron Harriman and Brian Morrison from the Pitt Lockery Lab in Scotland to look at sites with poor fish populations and high uh, acid acidity in the Galloway area of southwest Scotland. And they particularly looked at lakes and streams uh, sitting on these uh, granitic, granitic areas in, 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 in Galloway. Uh, and they, they analyzed, they, they looked at uh, macroinvertebrates and, and, and water chemistry and wrote a report and concluded, as you can see at the bottom, the Galloway area appears to be yet another region in which acidification of fresh waters has occurred because of deposition of strong acids from the, from the atmosphere. So this put the focus really in the Galloway area as a primary research area and one that we, we've worked and still work in extensively. Uh, you can see on the left there a close-up of a staircase of lakes, uh, which have proved to be very, very helpful in working out uh, the histories of these sites. And I'll just ring round Lock of Glen Head. I'll be mentioning it shortly, uh, Lock D, uh, and also Loch Enoch, three really important sites in terms of the work that we've done in the Galloway area. So the other uh, arguments or the hypotheses were that if it's not uh, acid rain, then it could be uh, a forestation. This is a picture in Galloway of a forestation. Um, it could also be a decline in, in grazing and burning in upland areas leading to regeneration of, of heather moorland uh, soil vegetation processes that could uh, lead to uh, acidification of surface waters. Another uh, hypothesis put forward by um, Mrs. Tutin Winifred Pending, Pennington working from the FBA at the time was that uh, recent acid rain was, was of relatively small importance. More important was the long, slow leaching of soils and acidification of surface waters over the post-glacial period. And this was a well-known process at the time by uh, paleolimnologists 
uh, one proposed uh, very eloquently by, by John Mackworth in famous papers in the 1960s. And on the left here, I'm just showing three uh, reconstructions of pH from Don Whitehead from 1986, again, uh, to show uh, evidence for that process. Uh, on the y-axis there, we've got 12,000 years, we've got pH, and you can see that these three sites in the Adirondacks in, in, in North America all started with more or less circumneutral pH, but then over the next two or 3,000 years, they acidified quite strongly. But as you can see from those data, uh, after about 8,000 years, there were not there were, wasn't really significant further acidification. It looks as if this long-term process is predominantly an early post-glacial change. But it gave us uh, another hypothesis to, uh, to examine. Um, in that report of the FBA in 1984, uh, Winifred Pennington states, our present state of knowledge of the terrestrial vegetation suggested a combination of a city-fying process had by 1800 AD produced a situation in the uplands of Cumbria where no further threshold of change was crossed as a result of the burning of fossil fuel. So th these different hypotheses are all related to process operating quite slowly over time. And so they were eminently testable using a paleolimnological approach. And what was inspiring to me, and I think to many paleoecologists at the time, was, uh, was Ed Devey's work, particularly this paper he published in 1969 uh, called Coaxing History to Conduct Experiments, where he says, where time is required to see a result, there's no substitute for history. Or it is sometimes forgotten that history provides some essential experimental conditions that need to be consciously sought and carefully attended by the experiment. So the question is, how can we look at lakes, compare them, compare different kinds of lakes, and use lake sediments to look at conditions through time to test these different hypotheses? Well, we started with a grant uh, from the Central Electricity Generating Board, the, the nationalized uh, utility in, in, in Britain before privatization by, uh, by, the, by the Thatcher, Thatcher government. And here's the round rock of Glen Head that I mentioned before. As you can see, it's got an entirely moorland catchment. So uh, if afforestation was to cause the acidification of this lake, then this lake shouldn't be acidified at all. Uh, it was uh, one of the first we looked at, uh, and it was, uh, it was Roger Flower, who worked very closely with me over in this, uh, this time, uh, as you see in the top right-hand corner there, who did the diatom. Uh, analysis and it's really quite clear looking uh, at that diagram of the different species with depth through the sediment core um, the, the present day is on the right hand side at zero going down 45 centimeters uh, and it's a relative abundance of these different species and from about the middle of the 19th century you can see the clear declines in some species and clear increases in others and the tabularia quadriceptata which is pictured in the SEM uh, picture there that Roger took uh, is the one that really indicates that serious acidification uh, in the in the 20th century. This was being funded, as I mentioned, by the CGB. They they were uh, uh, in denial at the time. They they were hoping that we would find evidence that it wasn't a result of acid deposition, um, as it was. Uh, our results are quite clear uh, that the primary hypothesis here was acid deposition. It certainly wasn't a forestation. So we wrote a paper for Nature. We had to submit the text, of course, to the CGB uh, for them to, uh, to agree. Uh, I was a bit concerned because it's not the result that they were looking for. Uh, Roger, I had a secure job, but Roger was a postdoc, and, uh, and I warned him that we might never get any more funding again, but we, this is what we, we, we have to publish these results. Uh, unfortunately, the CGB came back and uh, and were happy for us to publish the paper. The only change that they wanted, and if you look at the title there, it says Diatom Evidence for Recent Acidification of Two Scottish Locks. The original title was Diatom Evidence for Recent Acidification of Scottish Locks, because we inferred that if these, uh, this is Ground Lock of Glenhead and, and Loch Granach was acidified, then other lakes in the region would be. But they say you've only got evidence for two locks. Therefore, it should be two lots in the title of the paper. So it's my first encounter with, uh, with this kind of um, science spin uh, 
from vested interest sponsors. But uh, even more clear in terms of the afforestation uh, hypothesis was work on Loch D. Uh, this is Loch D on the right hand side, and the two pictures there, one, both of them taken by Derek Ratcliffe, the first in 1955 before uh, it was planted by mainly citrus spruce. Then again, from uh, the identical place in 2004, you see a, a forest has uh, established itself in Galloway. And then the left hand side, the diagram, again by, by Roger and showing this uh, 1963 date uh, here when, when, the, when the catchment was planted and quite clearly uh, the acidification began before that and the dating suggested to us it took place around about the end of the 19th century. You can see this very, very slow, gradual change in the diatom composition, uh, perhaps a half a pH unit on, on, on average over 100 over a hundred years, just showing how the importance of these, understanding these long slow processes are uh, in predisposing uh, ecological change. We then tackled the long-term uh, acidification uh, possibility, uh, and this was Viv Jones's PhD, another nature paper, where we looked at uh, the we use pollen analysis to uh, analysis done by Tony Stevenson uh, on the left hand side there to show the switch in the mid post glacial uh, time from a forested landscape to an upland peatland land landscape. Uh, that's quite clear uh, from the pollen analysis. Uh, and then on the right hand side, just some summary diatom data with that pH reconstruction uh, showing that despite that major change in vegetation from forest to moorland. Uh, there was very little change in the diatom composition and uh, in the acidity of the lake. But then if we go to the more recent period, well, we can see right at the top in the last 100 years or so, a strong expansion of diatoms found in very uh, acid waters uh, and this acidification uh, of the last few, few decades. And this is quite powerful politically because you can set the recent acidification there in the context of a 10,000 year uh, history. Uh, maybe surprisingly, we were still working with the CGB at this time and, and our minders in the CGB were still not convinced. Uh, they still thought that Galloway was so far to the west that it was very difficult to conceive that there was much acid deposition there. Um, uh, we agreed that maybe the ultimate test would be to work at Loch Enoch, the highest elevation site in Galloway, not just looking at diatoms to detect acidification, but also using pollen analysis again to look for changes in vegetation as a land use proxy, and to use trace metal analysis uh, to look for evidence of air pollution uh, using lead in particular as a proxy for acid deposition. This approach, of course, is very important in paleo knowledge has developed over the, over the years, whereby we use as many analyses of the same piece of sediment or same sediment core as possible to provide a range of different kinds of evidence about uh, ecosystem change. So here's Loch Enoch, an absolutely wonderful lake, a little island in the middle, and there's a lake in, on the island as well uh, in the middle, so it's a kind of lake in a lake. Uh, but uh, this kind of cloverleaf pattern, one of the basins uh, is relatively quite deep and has uh, a very good sediment accumulation. And so here are the results of the Loch Enoch study. Again, Roger Flower, uh, the diatoms here classified into different acid uh, tolerance groups, uh, showing the acidification, uh, the recent acidification, very similar to the round rock of Glen Head. Uh, Tony Stevenson's pollen analysis just showing curves here for heather, Coluna vulgaris, and for grasses. And you can see here that the trend is in the opposite direction. We're having less heather and more grasses, whereas if this was a reason for acidification, uh, we would expect to have more heather and less grasses. And then the trace metal analysis of Brian Rippey showing these big increases in lead, zinc, and copper uh, from the 1800s uh, onwards. And uh, so we published this paper in, in Nature as well. Uh, and uh, I think that had for us uh, quite an impact because it, it seemed to increase the amount of 
funds that we were able to apply for. But the real clincher in all this uh, was a very simple measure of uh, acid deposition. Uh, and th this was the concentration of spheroidal carbonaceous particles in lake sediments. You can see uh, in the middle there uh, an SAM picture of a spheroidal carbonaceous particle. This probably has come from oil burning. Neil Rose and his PhD worked on these and he was able to separate out these uh, spheroidal particles that came from coal uh, and oil, but, but they can only come from high temperature combustion of fossil fuel. And you can see from the curves on the left, work done by Judy Natkansky, who was an undergraduate at the time, uh, those big increases in these black spheroidal particles at the tops of the sediment cores. So indisputable evidence uh, of significant uh, deposition from fossil fuel combustion. And then finally, the last piece of this particular jigsaw uh, was then going uh, north to northwest Scotland, where sulfur deposition was very low. Uh, lakes are more or less pristine, and arguing that if we look at the datum records in the lakes that are as sensitive to acidification as, for example, the Round Rock of Glenhead in a high deposition area, we should see no acidification. And in fact, that's, we've done this at a number of sites in the northwest of Scotland. Uh, and you can see uh, here, uh, no, very little change in diatom composition through time. The diatom flora is very similar to the flora at the Round Rock of Glenhead before it started to become uh, acidified. So uh, a nice time-space comparison of acidification, all tending to support the acid deposition hypothesis. Well, in, despite all this evidence and the evidence of others working on acid rain at the time, uh, the UK government still held the line uh, that uh, it wasn't a serious problem. And they persuaded Norway and Sweden to take part in a joint research project administered by the Royal Society as the honest broker, as they said, to resolve the matter once and for all. We suspect at the time they were playing for time, but this did give us a, a big opportunity to, to do some more science. And we put together a paleolimnology team uh, with me in the UK, working with Ingmar Rehmberg in Sweden uh, and John Burks, who was by this time uh, working in Bergen uh, in Norway. And uh, it helped us develop a, a couple more uh, techniques. Um, one, because we were able to measure lots of different things um, on the same sediment sample, the constraint then was the actual dry weight or dry mass of a sediment sample, particularly one where, we'd, where we're looking for high resolution results by, by uh, slicing cores in, in very thin, uh, thin samples. Um, and, and where possible then to be able to use non-destructive analytical techniques. Uh, there was also this issue about uh, if we were working together between three countries and, and, and harmonizing our approach between laboratories, uh, were we all consistent in our diatom nomenclature uh, and identification standards? Uh, and uh, perhaps most significantly in terms of history of the science, uh, we needed a more statistically robust method of reconstructing pH. We've been doing this, as you can see from those previous diagrams earlier on, but we've mainly been using a technique from the literature where, where pH, where datums have been classified according to the different pH groups. And of course, that's sensitive then to the allocation of a diatom to a particular pH group. So it was important to improve this method of uh, pH reconstruction. So in terms of non-destructive techniques, uh, the leap forward here was one uh, of, uh, by Peter Appleby from Liverpool University, who, who's worked consistently with us over the years on let 2 10 dating, uh, when he said, well, we can use gamma spectrometry to look at let 2 10 uh, concentrations uh, in a non-destructive way. And at the same time, we can also, uh, 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 from the same spectrum, um, uh, identify cesium-137. And so this allowed us to slice sediment cores, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, in two millimeter slices. Uh, the amount of dry matter in a, in a wet two millimeter slice is very, very small. But we could then send that sample off and have it dated without uh, destroying the sample. Then it could go on for 
uh, trace metal analysis using uh, X-ray fluorescence, again, without destroying the sample. So we could make quite a number of measurements from these small samples uh, until we finally destroyed it uh, for something like datum analysis. Uh, so that was uh, the second stimulus that the swap gave us, uh, as I mentioned, was this need to standardize taxonomy. Um, I'm not sure whether this was pioneering on or not, but in chemistry, of course, all the labs had their analytical quality control procedures. And so we introduced what we call taxonomic uh, quality control, TQC, and we organized ring tests amongst the different diatomists in Norway, Sweden, uh, and the UK. And the UK was mainly our UCL lab, and it was Liz from the uh, from the FBA lab. Uh, and this is just uh, a diagram showing a before and after the before when we sent out a slide uh, from Lingmore Tarn, or, uh, one of Liz's slides in the, from the Lake District. Uh, uh, and the four different labs there, uh, the, the, the taxonomy that, 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 was, that was used and the nomenclature that was used. And then after workshops and discussions, we were able to harmonize really almost to 100%. Uh, and you can see the diagram at the bottom there after the harmonization process where we uh, almost all labs were perfectly in line with their analysis of, of the slide. But perhaps, uh, as I mentioned, most critically for the history of uh, and, and, and the future development of, of paleolimnology was this uh, improvement in ability to reconstruct environmental variables from biological proxy records. Uh, and this is now a classic paper, and it's all thanks to to, to John Burks and John Burks working with the statistician Kai Tabrak uh, and and with Steve Juggins uh, and and others. Uh, and the approach uh, is to uh, is to use uh, is to, is to is to look at the distribution of individual species in contemporary samples uh, and 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 estimate the pH optima of those different species from a, a local contemporary uh, training set uh, at the modern time. And then as you can see from this diagram, uh, if that relationship can be established, then there can be a numerical way of then reconstructing pH from an unknown uh, sample. So in SWAP, working with the three different countries, we put together a training set of 178 sites, uh, acid sites throughout these uh, three different countries, uh, and uh, identified uh, hundreds of different diatom species uh, and estimated the uh, pH optima of the different species. This is just an example here uh, of two species, Acnanthes magnetissima, which tends to have a high pH optima, and you, you know, so in size are a low one, you can see the distribution of abundances against the pH gradient there, and, and then using this weighted averaging method uh, to estimate the opta. Uh, and then the optima of the individual species can again, using weighted average, be used then to infer the pH of the unknown uh, fossil sample. And when we do that, and we compare the estimated pH uh, from the Darton uh, method, uh, with the measured pH, then we, we get uh, an extremely good relationship. So with the techniques we, we had and developed, we were able to carry on doing more uh, time-space experiments uh, within the SWAP program, doing before and after um, studies, comparing lakes in high acid deposition and low deposition sites, doing before and after studies at sites with the same acid deposition, comparing a forested and moorland site, uh, before and after natural vegetation changes in earlier time periods, e.g. in the mid-post-glacial period, uh, and before and after in remote mountain lakes above the timberline. Um, and these were all studies that were presented at a major Royal Society discussion meeting in, in 1989 and published in a Phil Trans uh, volume, as you can see here uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, as you can imagine, not just from the work that we were doing, but from many, many strands of work by, by modelers and, and fish biologists and, and others, uh, the evidence that the problem was all related to acid deposition was overwhelming. Uh, and uh, the British government actually accepted the inevitable uh, in 1986, even before the ends of these uh, major research projects. 
Um, I picked this up from the New York Times, September 12, 1986. After years of criticism as one of the worst polluters in Europe, Britain announced a 900 billion, no million, sorry, program today to begin limited controls of sulfur emissions, which have contributed to the acid rain that has damaged forests, lakes, and rivers in Scandinavia. The announcement that control devices would be installed at three of the country's 12 coal-burning power stations was made as Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher began a visit to Norway, uh, where officials have long complained about the ravages of airborne industrial pollution from Britain. It was important for Margaret Thatcher to resolve this because, in fact, she was standing for election again uh, quite soon afterwards, and it was one of these uh, issues, I think, that uh, was causing, adding to her unpopularity at the time. Anyhow, the whole thing was brought to an end. Hatchets were buried, and we had a wonderful banquet in the Royal Society in 1990. Uh, here's a menu card and the toast, the Queen, the King of Sweden, the King of Norway, and we had speeches from the prime ministers of the UK, uh, Sweden, and Norway. As a result of the acceptance that uh, acid rain was the cause of major problems of uh, upland uh, acidification of surface waters, the Department of the Environment, as it was called at the time, set up the Acid Waters Monitoring Network in 1988, now call it the Upland Waters Monitoring Network, with a whole consortium of uh, sponsors and, and science groups, um, principally the Marine uh, Scottish Lab in, uh, in Pitlochry, um, uh, Queen Mary, uh, led by Alan Hildrew, uh, and the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology, as well as us at UCL. I just pictured here uh, Don Monteith and Ewan Schilland, uh, two still working on the network uh, today, uh, responsible for coordinating much of the work that's gone on over the past 30 years or so. And then Simon Patrick, who was the managing director of our in house consultancy company, uh, Ensis, who again was very important in making a success of this uh, monitoring network. So here's the network. Uh, 20 or so lakes and streams in the uplands of Britain. Um, some pictures here. Um, they're in high and low acid deposition areas, uh, and there are some paired systems with and without forestry. Uh, the two in the middle there are the Gui and the Hafron, uh, very, very similar stream sites on Flynn Limon, one the forested, one non the forested. Then the Round Rock of Glenhead is an example of one of the lake sites in Galloway that I've mentioned already, and our site up in the Cairngorm Mountains, uh, which is a, the only truly alpine site we have, Loch Megar, and you can see the ice cover on that site as well. Um, Alan Hildrew's site is in there, at the famous old lodge site there at number 13. Uh, and I put in here Briani, Clim Briani, and this is uh, Steve Olmrot's site. I'm still not understand, I must talk to Steve about this at some stage, why in fact Climbriani uh, wasn't included in the network, but Climbriani you know, carries on today and that uh, has an even longer record of, of observations uh, than, the, than the Acid Waters Monitoring Network. What do we do at these sites? Well, I, this is the lake sites. Uh, ideally, uh, at all sites, we do chemistry and biology. The biology, uh, essentially epilithic diatoms, uh, the, an aquatic macrophytes that was the responsibility of UCL, uh, the macroinvertebrate uh, uh, studies, which uh, Alan, Alan Hildrew uh, was leading, uh, and fish biology that was the responsibility of the Pitt Locker Group. We also have sediment traps in that we inserted essentially to catch uh, diatoms uh, and, and, other, uh, and to do other analyses of sediment uh, that, that could be uh, on an annual basis, uh, so that, that, that could be related later on to the records that we had in the uh, in the sediment cores themselves. And at some sites we had colligated acid deposition monitors. I think they've all gone now, uh, but all the lake sites also have thermistor chains, and the stream sites have thermistors. So we have a, a building up a long record of temperature change as well. Well, what we tried to do over the years, it was very fully funded by, by DEFRA, by Dewey and then DEFRA uh, from 1988. And that funding uh, 
uh, extended right the way through till the financial crisis of 2008, uh, we were able uh, not only to keep the monitoring going of all these different determinants and report on an annual basis, but from uh, from on, uh, from time to time, hope, uh, the idea was to be be every five years we could we could we could s s step back and do uh, an in depth analytical uh, analytical uh, report interpretive report and these are two examples here the one from two, 2005 Monteith and Evans in environmental pollution and the last one we we did after 20 years in ecological indicators uh, edited by by Chris Kurt so where are we today uh, well I just pulled this off the DEFRA website uh, yesterday uh, and this shows the decline in sulfur dioxide emissions on the left and the decline in uh, nitrogen oxide emissions on the right hand side. You see, it's quite an amazing story. Uh, emissions were coming down before, uh, from 1970 onwards. Uh, the green arrow there is when the monitoring network started. So emissions have already come down by quite a considerable amount. But since then, they've come down, uh, well, well over 90, 95% of their 1970 concentration. Uh, a major success story in terms of emissions reduction. And again, not quite the same uh, degree, but, but uh, oxides of nitrogen are slower to come down and haven't come down quite as far, uh, but, but still at a steep decline and, and, and meeting the guidelines specified by the, EU, uh, by the EU directive, the National Emission Ceilings Directive. So I thank Don, Don Monteith for sending me the up-to-date chemistry data. Uh, we can see, as we might hope, with the decline in sulfur dioxide emissions, this is the data for the lake sites for the decline in non-marine sulfate. Uh, again, looks, uh, looks impressive, um, but uh, what we should bear in mind is what should the target be? And if we look at the concentration of non-marine sulfate up in the northwest of Scotland in sites that are only partially affected by acid deposition. The uh, concentrations of non-marine sulfate are, are often uh, less than 10 micro equivalents per litre. So come down a long way, uh, but it quite clearly uh, that decline in emissions has not been yet matched by the equivalent uh, decline in concentrations in, in lake water. Equally for nitrate, the big decrease in nitrate in emissions, uh, there is some decrease here in nitrate concentrations, uh, but it's not particularly impressive. Uh, the, the spike there uh, is, is a fire in the catchment of Blue Lock in, in 20, 2012. That was nice, a nice natural experiment as well, just showing how a, the fire led to that boost in nitrate concentrations and then the timescale uh, of uh, recovery. Uh, as the catchment be, be vegetated. But again, uh, what would we expect to be a kind of target for nitrate in upland waters? It should be almost be, 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 be zero. Um, but, so this might be the target line. Um, this is the concentration more or less that you would find at one of our control sites, Corifionorex. So uh, the nitrate concentrations are still above what we might call reference concentration. pH again, uh, good news that there is an increase in pH at all sites, as we might expect, given that decline in acid anion. Uh, but again, we, it's difficult to know what the target pH would be because a lot of it depends very much upon dissolved organic carbon concentrations. But we might expect pH of a naturally acid upland site uh, to be around about 5.786, something like something like that. So there's Again, a long way to go, perhaps, for some of these sites that are recovering. Just recently, we've had an update in terms of the diatom epilithon. Um, because of some renewed funding from DEFRA, we've been able to catch up with the diatom epilithon analysis uh, carried out by uh, Gina Henderson. Uh, and Steve Jenkins has been, uh, been modeling the trends. And in this, diagram here is been using the diatom acidification metric that Ian Martin Kelly uh, has developed for the Water Framework Directive 
and you can see in all cases, this is more or less all cases, these are streams and, and lakes. Uh, shown in blue here, there's some significant increases in pH. And just a couple of, uh, couple of uh, data sets uh, that I picked out here, the round block of Glen Head, the Galloway site, and Clean Claggy in, in, in Snowdon, just to show the species responses. These are the epilithic diatom responses from 1988 through to 2018. Uh, and uh, some variability there, but you can see over this long period of time, uh, a, just a gradual shift in the round rock of Glenhead from uh, the acid uh, tolerant diatoms to ones which are less acid tolerant. The switch from tabulary quadriceptata at the bottom uh, towards more tabulary flocculosa, I think is significant in that, in that context. And then uh, on the right came Claggy, um, a, 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 a more impressive uh, species turnover uh, with the loss of that tabulary quadriceptata indicator uh, in the first few years of, of monitoring. And then this uh, appearance of Brachysaura vitrea, which is a very common diatom in pre-acidification flora as, as, as a good indicator of, of improvement. So how do the sediment traps fit in? Well, the wonderful thing about the sediment traps is that the diatoms that we get in the sediment trap almost perfectly map onto the diatoms that you might find in a surface uh, sediment sample from, the core, from a core top. So it means we can actually overlap or merge or connect the, the data from the sediment traps with the data from the sediment cores and can give us a continuous metric going back 10,000 years if we wanted, but certainly here, going back to the beginning of the 19th century. And so here's a round rock of Glen Head. You can see the core in blue going back to 1800 or so, uh, and, and the sediment traps on an annual basis on the right. Uh, and uh, traps are not showing all that much uh, improvement. Again, this is the reference assemblage we would expect in the round rock of Glen Head, the Antinantes magnetissima brachysara vitrea. And uh, there's no, yeah, so far, there's no appearance of these uh, in the sediment traps. I must say that these are dated from 2013. We need to update these, these results. And again, the same for Claggy. As you can see, that decline in the tabulary quadriceptata in, in, in the, shown in the traps as well as in the epilithon. But the 19th century flora, this minutissima, uh, is yet to make uh, an appearance. And we can see this even better if we use uh, PCA approaches where we can ordinate the, um, the, the, the core uh, trajectories, the core diatoms, um, combining the, the sediment uh, records and the, and the sediment trap records in blue here, uh, passively introduced into a PCA of about 100 uh, surface samples uh, from, from, from the UK. And in the round lock of Glen Head, you can see the reference uh, assemblage there, the acidification trajectory, and then the 2013 value there. The same approach for King Claggy, and we can compare that with our reference sites, uh, Corin and R, where you can see the assemblage has not changed over the last 200 years. The sediment traps and the sediment cores all cluster tightly together. And the same in Bermotan, uh, a high alkaline reference a higher alkaline reference site in the English lake. The question now is, where are we in 2021? Uh, are we heading back towards that reference point there? We need to uh, uh, update our analyses and, and, then, and then run these, run this again. So just to finish off, uh, this is, um, I think this is my <laughs> diagram that sums up my, uh, my, my career, I guess. It's really quite a simple thing, uh, but I think, uh, fairly powerful as well, because it, it shows what you can do if you have high resolution paleolimnological records uh, and, and long-term records that you can connect to them. Uh, and it, it gives this possibility of looking at the reference point in historical time there, A, the trajectory as the acid deposition or, or any other environmental pressure, in fact, exerts uh, on the biology there to the point where there is some intervention, some, some introduction of measures to try to ameliorate the system in acid deposition, clearly the reduction in, in acid deposition, and then we might expect or hope some kind of recovery uh, back down in this direction here. 
the how far back we go is some kind of measure of success. But there's also the question as, will it actually go back down through the same kind of compositional trajectory, or, or will we head off into a different uh, ordination space, and maybe eventually uh, through a kind of hysteresis process, head back to where we started, or will we head off into some entirely new assemblage, a kind of novel response that we might expect if, for example, climate change kicks in uh, and causes a major uh, impact on the recovery process. So that's it. I just want to show Upland Waters Monitor Network today and to give thanks to uh, CEH and particularly to Don Monteith because uh, ENSYS uh, collapsed a few years ago having struggled to keep the monitoring network going. Uh, we now have the ENSYS Trust, which puts in a small amount of money to help the monitoring network. But CEH now runs it. Don Monteith uh, is in charge. Uh, Ewan Schilland on the left there has, has manfully, in fact, uh, helped to keep it going through his last three years of doing, doing a PhD. Uh, but the good news is that uh, DEFRA have coming back in to uh, provide some funds, not much, uh, but enough to keep it going. It's still struggling. Um, to have the complete system operating, but there's a little bit of uh, hope for the future. And I just want to finish off by saying I've worked with a lot of remarkable people over the years, uh, won uh, wonderful people across the world, actually, uh, especially in major European projects. But I just wanted to pick out this group here. It's a picture we took in 1988 of mainly the postdocs uh, at the time. Um, a lot of people that you might be familiar with looking quite a bit younger. Uh, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, for that, Rick. Uh, we already have a couple of questions coming in. That was a, that was a great talk. Um, can I ask uh, Richard to come forward and ask his question? Right. Uh, yes, well, thank you for a most interesting lecture. I remember the, the great acid rain panic of many years ago. Uh, I'm just wondering about Chernobyl. Has that provided a useful uh, dating marker for your work? Well, funny enough, in fact, really, I knocked that slide out just to, just for, just for time. Um, I could have put that slide back in again, in fact. But, but yes, it did. Um, in fact, 1963, cesium peak, of course, have been declining because the uh, cesium-137 has got a half-life of 30 years, so that peak has declined. But of course, the Chernobyl explosion was wonderful. It just came at the right time. Uh, it gave us a nice marker for 1986. And in cores taken since then, uh, it's very, very clearly there. In cores that we took almost immediately after Chernobyl, we also had a spike of cesium-134, but that only has a very short half-life, so that's disappeared. But we are left with, uh, with the Chernobyl peak as well. So that, so when we get when we can line up cesium one three seven from uh, nuclear weapons testing, the Chernobyl nineteen eighty six peak, and and a good series of let two ten dates, then we can really do quite a good job in dating sediments that have accumulated over the last hundred years or so, which is a perfect time scale to look at this kind of decadal scale change. Hey, thank you, Richard. Uh, Pedro has a question next. Sorry, Pedro's uh, question is, is acid rock drainage an issue in the UK as in the central Peruvian Andes due to rapid gla uh, glacier retreat? All right, we don't have any glaciers, so it's not really an issue here, but I'm not familiar with the uh, Peruvian Andes work. If anybody else has any questions for Rick, you can unmute yourself and, and ask them now. Rick, if you were to start again now, what would be the problem you'd focus on? If to start again, what's the problem we'll focus on? Yeah. So given that you were about to embark on a new journey of discovery, huh. where would you focus on why? Using the Lake Sediment uh, Archive. Uh, I mean, the, the issue now, uh, I think, is the extent to which climate change um, is deflecting, um, if you like, lake trajectories. What's interesting at the moment is that there's not a lot of evidence yet from the acid waters monitoring network data 
of a big impact of increasing temperatures or some evidence that, that high precipitation events uh, have, have an impact uh, in terms of uh, increasing acidity. Um, so I, I think the issue now is, is, is trying to look at the, and understand how lakes respond uh, on the one hand to recovery from pr pressures such as nutrient pollution and acid rain uh, at the same time as we're changing the baseline of climate particularly with respect to temperature and precipitation uh, and it, 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 if we have more significant increases in temperature and precipitation uh, then undoubtedly there is going to be some interesting responses uh, from our uh, lake systems and the data that we get from the sediment records is increasingly important in, in knowing what states we've had in the past and the extent to which in fact new states are deviating from from the past so i I, th I think it would still have to be that increased complexity of of the confounding impact of climate change on recovery from pollution. Thanks, Rick. Um, I was interested in, you know, that uh, the, the graphs you showed of, of sulfur and nitrate and those targets that you uh, that you were kind of suggesting. I, I can kind of understand why, why nitrate with, with land use change, we might not be seeing nitrate um, decreasing particularly fast, but what do you think we can do to, to decrease the amount of sulfur quicker than it's naturally happening? I don't, I, yeah, very, very little. I would, I would suggest. I think this is legacy sulfur, legacy uh, nitrate in in in, in soils. Um, there's a, we have a lot of data to show that, and the, perhaps the most um, extreme or most impressive would be the data we have from the North York Moors. Um, probably the North York Moors have probably received the greatest hammering from acid rain than any other part of of the UK, being, you know, downwind from the three massive uh, power stations um, and uh, the, the it's not just Danby Beck which is which is now one of our monitoring network sites but the whole range of ponds and streams in that area have still very low pH pH not much more than four um, and very high concentrations of, of nitrate and, and sulfur uh, and I think it's just the fact that the soils in the North York Moors uh, are, are actually saturated, and I don't see, you know, how it can be ex how the, how it's how it can be reduced rapidly. It, it's a question of long periods of time. Um, I think this is one of the biggest issues. Coming back to the previous question, in fact, really, uh, of, of what would you study now? Um, and one of the I think concerns that, that I would have. Uh, in terms of recovery is this major issue of legacy, uh, legacy pollutants from the past. And uh, we talk about legacy radioactivity, we talk about legacy PCBs and, and DDT, but there's also a lot of legacy acid deposition uh, in our upland soils, in fact, that will take uh, decades and centuries, in fact, to, uh, to, to, to gradually uh, leach out. Thanks, Rick. Um, Karen Evans says, thanks for letting me join the team in, in Claggy, <laughs> just for information. <laughs> um, Alan Hildew asks, um, how does paleolimnology deal with the possibility of alternative stable states? Well, paleolimnology is looking at the past, so, so what it, it's showing us in our uh, states in the past, um, if we go back in the past over in, in high resolution, we can actually see the extent to which systems are stable or can actually flicker. Um, and that shows some sensitivity from moving from one state to another. Um, so I think it's possibly an issue of helping us to understand sensitivity to, to that possibility. Um, I'm not sure whether in, in, in acidity that, that there are alternative stable states. Um, but clearly in terms of eutrophication, eutrophication of shallow lake, that's been very well demonstrated. Uh, and I think there are paleolimnological records that actually show, uh, show that, uh, provide evidence for that. Um, one, of the, one of the approaches using sediments 
uh, is to look at uh, the period just before a major change uh, in status uh, and to look at variability in the sediment record. The problem is that quite often sediment records get smoothed by bioturbation or we don't have quite the resolution we need. But if you have very, very high uh, sediment uh, uh, accumulation rates, or in fact, in some cases, you have annually laminated sediment, then it is possible to start to look at uh, interannual variability and see whether the, the, uh, the increases in that variability uh, can ever give you insights into the potential for alternative states. Uh, to occur. I'm not sure whether, Alan, that, that helps at all to answer your question, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I thought you answered it pretty well. I, I only asked it to be difficult, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that to start with. <laughs> <laughs> as, as is your work. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Mark, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, but, but perhaps we have a... Um... Thanks for a great talk. Um, should say that first, um, and a good insight into paleolithology. I, I can't hardly imagine how much work it is to, you know, do all these analyses with the detailed, deep cores. It must be absolutely mind-boggling. But uh, partially related to to Alan, also my question was um, when you talked about legacy, is maybe not just. Uh, the elements that were deposited, but also those that were gone, depleted, the carbonates that were dissolved yeah. and uh, are no longer available. So even if you get rid of, yeah. you know, the causes, yeah. uh, the legacy might be very long, and you might call it uh, a stabilizing effect as you see it in uh, when you observe regime shifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's right, and and. I Take that point entirely, in fact, really, and, and certainly a case in terms of uh, the loss of base cut ions in, in long term weathering of factory and the speed with which that uh, base cut iron status can be regenerated back from through, uh, through primary weathering of fact, extraordinarily slow processing. So, yeah. Yeah. Can that be quantified when, um, Sorry? you know, if you take uh, have a, a catchment scale analysis of the budgets of the ions and the weathering rates that you need to know. Uh, can you project when to expect um, a return to the original conditions? You said you don't really know where the baseline was. But I wonder whether that can be projected based on rates that can be measured today. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are biogeochemists actually who can, uh, who can uh, answer that question uh, intelligently. Um, I think it will depend on system to system, in fact, just depending upon the suite of minerals that, that are available yeah. and, and the process is actually operating in those catchments. Uh, but th they almost certainly are, are slow processes. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thanks for your nice talk. Uh, I'm just wondering if do you have in, in some of these environments, do you ever have uh, uh, methane uh, emissions interfering with your uh, what you have been measuring. It, 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 is it an issue to be considered? Uh, the, the, I think the problem, the only problem with methane emissions that I've come across is is not, not so much in the acid systems, but in hypertrophic lakes uh, where you have uh, very high concentrations of organic matter um, in deep waters um, under pressure. And, uh, and if you try to take a core in a situation like this, then you bring the sediment up to the up to the surface, and and and, and the methane uh, then bubbles up and and completely destroys the the, uh, the sediment record. Um, and the only the only way around that, I think, and it's I've done some of this in in, in working in Finland, is is to freeze the freeze the sediment in situ and. Uh, uh, that, that 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 works, um, and then freeze dry the uh, the, the, the core and, and, and then take up samples. Um, but, but that that's that's been the main concern I've had with 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 methane how how to how to get good uh, good samples uh, when you change the pressure of bringing the samples up from a deep water. Thank you. 
think that's all the questions. Thanks, Rick. That was a that was a brilliant talk and a really nice discussion at the end there. So I think all that's left to say is, um, yep, again, thank you, Rick. And uh, join us for our next seminar, which will be announced on the FBA website shortly. Um, and we hope to, hope to see you all there.